So if you want philosophy and you want things to make sense and to be logical, Peter's a good guy to listen to, as well as Brett, as well as John. John's more contemplative, though. I really appreciate the process there. There's usually a little more liturgy, a little more space to, to sit and think. Uh, Brett has kind of the, I'm just going to stab you with this. Like, this is what's going on. This is, this is what's up. I'm a little more stream of consciousness. So uh, for those of you who are like me, welcome. For those of you who are not, we will pray for you. Um, is it okay if I sit here? Is that all right? Sweet. Um, so if any of you read the E News, right? Is that? S News is paper. Okay, thanks. E News is email. Uh, then you'd see that the topic of this is holy loving. And yes, I did the, we're going to Christianese play on words, H-O-L-Y or W-H-O-L-L-Y. Uh, I don't know about you, but I like to divide everything. Everything's got its place. Uh, and for someone like me, that might mean, you ever, you ever heard the phrase, hiding up? You have people who are coming over in a half hour and there's stuff all over the place. So in order to get everything in its right spot, or what actually more often happens is I need to go to work. Uh, one of my offices is downstairs in the basement. I go to the basement. There are papers and everything all over my desk, which normally fit some sort of mental piles in my brain, but it's not the task I have to work on. But in order to work on that, what I need to do, none of these papers apply to, but the fact that they're out is going to distract me so I have to get them out of the way so they don't take up space in my visual or my brain. And so you stick them in a drawer, right? You just put, push everything together, stick it in the drawer. That's called hiding up, uh, in case you didn't know that. And it helps me to get rid of the extra stuff that is going to distract me from the thing that I'm trying to do. So I like to compartmentalize. Uh, one of the things I also like to compartmentalize is my emotions. Um, I don't know about you, but emotions are bad, right? Wait, okay, I'm getting some looks. Uh, no, they're not. But I spent 40 years of my life uh, being told, this is just life, get over it kind of thing, or that's just the way it is. You don't need to cry about it. So uh, I had a coworker who I used to make cry all the time just by interacting with her because uh, she was very sensitive. I, and I, however, had not cried in forever uh, until, like, I think it might have been Wreck-It Ralph. Man, Pixar has a way of just tugging at your heartstrings, doesn't it? Anyone, anyone else cry in Pixar movies? Okay, yeah. The part where she, like, she makes her little hero medal for Ralph, and then she, uh, Princess Vanellope von Schwartz or whatever, she puts her medal on him because uh, he's her hero. Like, that got me. Uh, and that kind of opened, started opening the floodgates. I'm like, what is my problem? Apparently, my problem was not crying before, you know, and uh, being emotional and recognizing that you have emotions and that type of stuff. That was, that was actually healthy. So uh, let's take a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us some space to process. Uh, I'm gonna give myself some space to process. Thank you, by the way, for coming on Sunday morning and processing with me. <sighs> I am feeling right now a little bit of anxiety, a little anxiousness, because I'm speaking to you guys uh, about God's Word, hopefully. Well, I'll bring up Scripture, don't worry. Uh, there will be a basis for what I'm talking about. A little embarrassment uh, for leading worship and speaking, because you know, every now and then it's like, oh, it's the Anthony show. There's been a couple of comments like that during the week. And I, I really hope that, you know, like if I stare down a lot because I don't really want it to be the Anthony show. Like, to be honest, if I could wear like, well, if we could be in the back and lead worship, that'd be awesome. And you guys would be focused on the cross or the words or whatever. Like that would, that would really be my ideal setup uh, because it's not really about us. It's not really about me. So there's a little bit of the fact that I was doing worship and, and preaching, uh, there's a little bit of shame there. Um, what else am I feeling? I feel like excited just to talk to you guys. Uh, and, and again, like I said, stream of consciousness, because I can 
like prepare a full message, we can exegete things uh, and use the homiletics and all those other fancy words that you pay, you know, hundreds to thousands of dollars uh, for some of us to get degrees in just to verify that we know what we're doing with God's word and you should listen to us. And then you talk to people and it doesn't matter how much of God's word uh, they've read or you've read, we usually just kind of go with what we think and believe anyways. Uh, if the pastor says something I don't agree with, then it's like, eh, are they really right? Uh, I don't remember reading that in the Bible. I'm not going to go check, and I'm not going to go read the Bible to find out. I just don't agree, and I'll continue on with my life as usual. And that kind of puts us in this place of, uh, I was talking with my wife uh, recently, and we were watching, anybody into the show Suits? Yeah, it's kind of a fun show. It's a little sketchy at times, but it's really fun. And it, you know what's really fun is watching people problem solve things and they come up with answers and then they use laws and rules to fight with each other and argue and somebody comes out a winner. There's a right answer. It's not like that with God's word. Like we a lot of times argue with our, ourselves, with each other, and then we walk away and it's like, okay, so what do we do now? Because I still believe what I believe and you still believe what you believe and I don't even if you change my mind, I don't necessarily know what to do with that. And I know Peter has addressed that at times, and, and I think I, think I kind of push him sometimes in terms of, okay, well, what do we do? What do we do? Give me an application. Tell me what to do, pastor. Uh, and that just doesn't seem to be how God operates in terms of, I'm just going to tell you what to do. Uh, I really wish he would at times, don't you? Like, I need to go... I'm not satisfied at my job. I'm not satisfied in a relationship that I'm in. What do I do about it? And then it's like, ah, nobody's giving you the answer. And you just have to sit there and try and figure it out. And I believe there's a sermon you can look up uh, about this very thing that Peter preached on one time. And, it, and it's almost like you have to love that person. And you can't just ask them, just tell me what to do. You know, tell me what to do to show you that I, show you that I love you. And it's like, no, you figuring it out is you showing me that you love me. You learning to love me, getting to know me well enough that you're going to start loving me better. Like, that's what you do. So there is an aspect of doing and that's kind of where my, my brain is, like, dealing with things. Um, so back in 2018, um, I went in the hospital with uh, um, viral myocarditis. So a quarter of my heart looked like it was dead. Uh, and they're like, well, if that doesn't come back in a couple days, then, uh, you know, heart transplant list is where we're going to have to put you. Um, the ejection fraction, if you know what that is, was at 20%. So my heart wasn't pumping enough blood to my body. Uh, and for about five days, uh, I laid in bed. And uh, I think my wife was a hot mess uh, during that time. Uh, again, mainly because she wouldn't know any of the username and passwords for paying our bills. Uh, so if I went that, that was really the thing that I was most worried about was making that Excel sheet, you know, afterwards. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying life. I'm just sitting there. They gave me morphine when I came in. That stuff is really nice when you need it. It's not very nice if you're addicted to it. Um, and, uh, and I'm laying in bed. I had a buddy who came and visited. He brought me, you know, for, uh, I'm in cardiac, and I might have told you this, but I love this story, so I'm going to tell it again. Uh, but I'm in cardiac ICU, and uh, two of my friends gave me gifts for being in the hospital. One of them was a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. On my bedside, by the monitor, like that's measuring my heart rate and stuff like that. That guy's awesome. I love him. Uh, and then another guy got me a, a bottle of like single malt scotch <laughs> when I got out of the hospital. So Thankfully, five days later, the necrotic part of my heart started pumping again. Uh, about six months later, I was cleared structurally, so it was like my heart was normal. I just, I tell you what, man, getting back in shape, eating the right things, all that type of stuff, that's really hard. Anyone else have problems with that? Okay, yeah, and, and that's kind of like, so yeah, so I took the meds, I rested, like I had a prescription from the doctor that I could give to my job if they wanted, but I work for a nonprofit, so they weren't going to care too much anyways, that like, oh, you have to do two weeks where you cannot move? No problem. So that was nice, 
but I, I still have the prescription. I love it. It's kind of cool. Two weeks of the doctor says, don't do anything. You can't work. Um, and then uh, six months and I'm fine. And that was, so that's 20, middle of 2018, end of 2018. Uh, and now I have to start getting healthy. But I'm in ministry. Uh, and this is not like to say that those who aren't in ministry are exempt from this. But tell me if you resonate with this. So I am constantly going from one task to the next. Uh, I have way too much to do in general. So I go to bed late. Well, and uh, let, me, let me not sound too holy and important here. Um, my kids go to bed late I have stopped working at this point, but I still want to hang out with my wife and do fun things. So I'm going to stay up late, right? It's the kind of thing of like, ah, the kids are in bed. You know, sleep when your kids sleep. No way. I'm hanging out and I'm playing and now I'm going to be on my phone or I'm going to, you know, go and do whatever. We're going to watch a movie. We're going to read a book, whatever. Is is that relatable? So you end up losing sleep. Uh, You go to bed late. You still have responsibilities. Get the kids to school, do all these things. You got to get up early. Um, And then I've got these people that I need to meet with. We have a house to clean because ministry is happening inside our house. And it's this, uh, we would never live in something this size in general. Uh, but because of our job, we have a 4,000 square foot place that we have, you know, about 100 people uh, on every Friday night coming into. We're cooking meals. We're meeting with people individually. We're running about four small groups. There's also a, t- a Czech uh, children's home uh, and church that we're partnered with that we go to about every other month, at least every quarter to do a big event with them. Uh, there's ref- about 80 refugees down the street from us uh, that we're going, we're hanging out with them sometimes. Uh, and then there's a German group. Oh, and don't forget Pokemon Go. Man, that's awesome. Uh, I've got an American group of soldiers, uh, young couples and single soldiers, and uh, German guys uh, that we, we play Pokemon Go together. You got to do that. Uh, so that's about 10 kilometers of walking uh, whenever day you do that. So, so I'm pretty like, just go, go, go. Um, it's hard to focus when you're going, right? Like, you're just constantly doing this. So I started realizing that I may be kind of doing life as usual, but I am not doing life by any pace other than the, the speed of just go. That's it. And I wasn't getting any healthier in that scenario. I'm not resting. I'm not, you know, other than when I'm thirsty, I'm not drinking. I'm not hydrating. I'm not uh, working out other than lifting a, a fork and spoon to my mouth because it's a hospitality ministry, so you got to eat, right? When you meet with people, you meet over food and fun drinks and coffee like that. I'm, I'm allergic to coffee, so I, I just like saying it. Uh, that's about all I can take of it. Um, and that's kind of part of the reason why we moved here and switched to the position that I'm in was to kind of give us some space to kind of get healthy because for 20 years we've been running around and doing ministry and just constantly focusing on other people uh, that we kind of forgot about ourselves. Uh, Our kids were going to German school, um, but they're Americans, but we don't have ID cards and privileges to where they can hang out with American kids on base. So they're kind of stuck between two cultures. They're Americans to the Germans they're weirdos and Germans to the American kids, and they can't really fully integrate with either of them. So they're kind of stuck between worlds. German school is a little tough for them uh, as it, it progresses, and uh, you know we're getting tired and worn out. So we, we come here to the States, and it's time to focus on getting healthy, which is nothing new to any of us. Would anyone in this room disagree with the concept of you should take care of yourself and be healthy? Okay, cool. I've got one laugh and no nays, so we're good. All right. So, on the note of familiar, let's look at a familiar passage real quick. So, if you want to, you can turn with me uh, to Matthew 22 or turn on your app with me uh, to Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. And... I just want to remind us of a couple things. 
And when I start reading this, you may be like, I didn't need to open my Bible for that. Here, let's test that out, okay? When the crowds heard him, Jesus, they were astounded at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, which is why they were sad, you see, with his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? We know what the law of Moses is, right? In general. It's the Ten Commandments is kind of the general idea that we go for in the law of Moses. Which one's your, I'm not, say favorite, yeah, maybe favorite. Which one do you think is most important out of those? If first one, love the Lord your God, or is that what it says? What does it say? But that's what it says here, but in the Ten Commandments, what is it? No other gods before God. So there are other gods. And that seems like it, it should be the most important. But for some reason, Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, doesn't say that. He says, you must love the Lord your God, or you shall, or you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. There's a word missing there, feels like. What? Strength. I thought that was in here. Any of you ever go to the Bible and you're like, wait, I, don't, I thought there was more here. Or you read something, you're like, I don't ever remember reading that. This is why going back to familiar passages is important. And having our hearts open wide and stuff is important because, I don't know, man. It's almost like God engages with us whenever we're willing. So you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. There's a hierarchy. Let's pay attention. If that's the first and greatest, let's see what the next is. A second is equally important. Well, there goes the hierarchy. You have one that's the first and greatest, and we have a second, which is equally as important. So we're, it's first and greatest as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Ah, oh, man, this is fun. Again, stream of consciousness. So here's the deal. I don't know about you, but let's, let's get the basics out of the way. You can sum up all of this with essentially four words. Four words to get the main meaning or the main idea or the, most, the greatest and important and equally as important idea out of this. Love God, love others. At least that's what I've grown up as. And uh, it's, it's been fun. Uh, Jessica has been uh, studying spiritual direction and stuff, and she's been reading a bunch of cool books. And then I just, you know, get the main points from her so that I get smarter as well, but I don't have to put in the effort um, or as much effort. But uh, she was reading a book by Eugene Peterson, and uh, I think this is who it is. I, I think I also have misquoted this a second time. She can correct me later, or you can correct me now if you want. I'm up for that. Um, but there's, there's something that we're missing here. And it's because I think when we hear the Garden of Eden story, I, I don't know how many of you were introduced to the gospel this way, but it, the, this, is, this is my understanding of the gospel as I grew up. You suck. God is awesome and did something amazing for you, and you should uh, accept him into your life as your savior and then live for him and do all the right things. Does that sound about on par for what most of us have probably come in to this with. So, and, and, and it's the you suck part. That, that's kind of the, the beginning because it's not good news unless you have bad news, right? Like you have to know how bad you are in order to know how good God is. And it's like, well, that kind of feels like then that God's goodness is dependent on your badness. 
versus God is just good and that's who he is. And maybe uh, you can come to know God and experience him without necessarily having to acknowledge how horrible you are as a person or us as humanity. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm not saying that there aren't things that we need to grow in. But as a starting point, I wonder if we're not missing the point of the gospel. Because if you look in the Garden of Eden, it, it feels like we kind of like, okay, God created all this stuff. Uh, he had all these trees for you to choose from, and he just had one tree there to acknowledge free will. Uh, but to, here's just one place I don't want you to go. But here's thousands of places you can go. What will you choose? And he offers that. And it feels like then, okay, then we get to the part of the fall uh, in chapter three, and we're like, all right, then we all are horrible people as humanity. And you would have done the same thing. You're a horrible person. And, and that's our starting point, it feels like, as humans. We start from a place of chapter three, and we ignore chapters one and two of Genesis. When really what happened is you were created to create life. You are a creation of a good God. You were created, uh, and God looked at you and said, no, you're very good. And you were his creation, and he invited you to rule over the earth and subdue it. So he gave you authority. He gave you rule. Uh, he told you to work the garden, which I love it, is let's walk around and eat fruit while we see how awesome this garden is. Uh, that's working. I mean, that's probably entry-level job. You know, you probably move up to pruning. Because uh, I think there is an aspect that's kind of interesting that, that God created and then uh, he saw that it was good, but then he left us in there to then create more. So there's an aspect of, like, I want to look at the Garden of Eden and think, well, that was utopia. That was perfection. God created it. It was the best it could be. And, and it's like, no, he created it, and it was going to produce life no matter what. But if we got involved in the process, we would then help create even more life. So there, there still was work to be done, but it was good work. And then we decided to cut off relationship with God or that we didn't want him to be a part of the process. We wanted to, to be, well, this is our garden and this is us making life without God. And then, so we kind of go off the rails there, but you start from a place of you are a creation of a good God that was created with the purpose of bringing life. And you were chosen by God. You are a chosen creation. And so that's really where we start. But for me, I come to this passage and I come with the you suck version of the Bible that paraphrases this passage to love God and love others. And my problem is, is I've missed out on somebody. Is anybody else with me here? Who are we missing? You have to love yourself. That just sounds wrong, doesn't it? Because we're supposed to sacrifice and we're supposed to give up ourselves. And it's not about us. It's, that would be selfish for it to be about us. But I'm pretty sure if you go back and look, the second, this is verse 39, a second commandment is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I don't know about you, I mean, we're all different people. So some of us in here are content with the first part. Love the Lord your God with all of those things. Who cares about the other ones? I love God. People are stupid. I don't need to love them. Or at least I only love certain ones. You know, the ones who give me Christmas cards uh, every year. Or whatever it is. Whatever your standard is. And then there's some people who don't really love God. Maybe because they don't know him. Or maybe because they're angry with him. And so they love people well, but they don't love themselves well or they don't love God. And then there's some people who just love themselves and they don't love God or love others. So we can get caught in all of these things, but if we want to be complete people, if we want to live in complete faith, if we want to, I mean, to be honest, if you love God, but you don't love people, do you really love God? If you love people, but you don't love God who 
is wanting to show you the best and greatest and healthiest way of loving people, then are you really going to fully love people well? And if you're not loving yourself, how well can you love God and love other people? Because if I have a messed up view about who I am, who God's created me to be, then do I really know who God is? Am I really connecting with God and understanding his view of who I am and who everybody else is? It makes it, makes it like you really can't have one without the other in this situation, but we live fragmented lives. We live in ways where we want either consciously or unconsciously to n ignore parts of this. It's easier just to focus on this one area, which, I mean, it's kind of been how it is for me recently of, well, what's my focus? If any of you have had a real conversation with me recently, you might know I'm a little discontent in my current position at work right now because paperwork is not my thing uh, and life is not quite what I expect it in the role that I'm in. So I'm a recruiter as of right now. We call it mobilizer. It makes it sound fancier, but then you tell someone you're a mobilizer and they're like, I don't understand what that means. So I recruit. Um, and uh, so I find people to hopefully uh, minister to military people and their families. Jessica, she, once they're hired, she then trains them and coaches them and helps them raise finances to then go to the field. Uh, so we're the dynamic duo of mobilization, uh, at least within our household. I don't think anyone else calls us that within our organization, but... Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, Batman and Robin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, that would be cool if they called us that. Uh, Allie really loves talking about Robin, so if you're ever interested in the lore of uh, Robin as a sidekick, there's four of them, by the way. Uh, she can tell you all about them. Um, I cannot, but uh, theoretically, I can tell you about what God's been doing in terms of uh, helping me to learn to love myself uh, and how that doesn't, in my mind, compute as selfish. Well, actually, I'm trying to help myself not view it as selfish. There's just something about when you, like, I'm in a job that's ministering to military people. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to recruit and find people. And the main thing that apparently I'm supposed to be working on right now is getting healthy. And that just doesn't compute in my brain. Is anybody else there with me? It's like, I'm going to do this job, but the best way for me to do that is to focus on myself. And it's, it feels wrong. But here's the deal. Uh, the passage, Jesus invites his disciples on the night, of, you know, that he, the night that he was betrayed. Um, he's going to pray, right? And he takes some disciples with him, and he invites them to pray with him, and what happens? They fall asleep. Whether, hey, it's been a long day, Jesus, okay? I'm tired. You are an intense man, God, Jesus. So following you is exhausting. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I want to pray, but I'm going to sleep instead. That's the best I can convince myself right now of it's okay to focus on taking care of yourself. Because the disciples, for whatever reason, whether they were partying the night before, which they had, they had a dinner, right? There was, there was some sort of dinner party or something going on uh, recently. They had just did that. They've been going. They, they know something's about to happen. Jesus' intensity is ramping up. It's late at night. They go into the garden, and they're going to pray, and they fall asleep. Because they're tired, they cannot stay awake to pray. So there's some connection between physical and spiritual at least consequentially. If I don't have enough rest and I'm exhausted and I pass out, then I am not consciously praying, right? At the very least. If I don't get enough sleep and I'm driving home, uh, then I could fall asleep at the wheel. There's certain things that if we don't take care of ourselves, things can happen, okay? That's why you drive in the center line of a three-lane highway, and then you fall asleep there. That way, if you hit the bumps going out of lanes. No, that's not a healthy way of dealing with things? Okay, all right. 
Maybe we should sleep then. So those are the four areas that I've been convicted of in my life. Sleep, hydration, working out or running, and food. Is anyone else afraid for me to go on? Because if I go on, here's the thing. There's an aspect here of, of doing. I have to do something within these. If I sit and think about them, I will maybe get more inspiration about the situation. Maybe I'll come to a clearer understanding about these areas. But if I don't actually make a choice and take a step in these areas, then nothing changes really. My excitement about sleep doesn't suddenly give me energy. You know, my, my uh, understanding of my need for water and how it plays into the molecules and everything of my life, my understanding doesn't suddenly make my body a well-oiled machine where I can continue on and not die of dehydration or heat stroke or whatever, especially in our current climate situation. Man, it's fun. So there's a certain aspect that I have to do. Now, is that the same as our spiritual? I don't know. Let's, let's talk about it for a second. So rest and sleep. What's our pattern or our understanding and how it relates to the Lord with rest and sleep? Everything comes from rest, and our fancy, whoo, that was weird. Apparently, I need to stretch. Uh, and our fancy religious word for it is Sabbath, Shabbat, Sabbat. So, creation happens. We are the last thing created. And God says, all right, get to it after you're created, right? Or is the creation story more accurately, you're created, and then God says, let's chill and look at how awesome this creation is. Like, that's, that's what we were invited into. We were invited, we were created, and then invited into rest. And out of that, and it wasn't until here at the sanctuary, so again, here, here's part of my process. It wasn't until we came here to the sanctuary, and I don't know if it's Peter or somebody else, of, I had actually never put it in that order before. Years of Bible education, self-study, school, formal education, that type of stuff. And it was always, yes, here's the creation account, blah, 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 you're created, and then God rested on the seventh day. It wasn't your first day living in creation was resting. And then you work out of your rest. Whereas in most of us, if you're like me, we haul all week That's most of us. We just haul all week. But if you exercise any day of rest, you're going all week, and then you try to catch up on rest on that seventh day. Is anybody else in that category? Okay. Um, they used to put people to death for not exercising the Sabbath. So I did, we went, preached through Matthew 20 and uh, our former uh, ministry assignment. Uh, not Matthew 20, preached through Matthew uh, took two and a half years, didn't get all the way through it, uh, and then we came here to Denver. But we had a saying, Sabbath or die, okay? Because uh, if you lived in the Old Testament, that's what happened. If you didn't Sabbath, you could be killed for that, okay? If you don't Sabbath now, and here's where, well, sorry, let me finish my thought. If you don't Sabbath now, you could still die from that, consequentially. If you go, 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 and you don't rest, uh, there's a good chance that you might not live the full extent of what your capacity of life would be. All right. Of course, we also have Ecclesiastes and other wisdom literature. It's like, well, you could also do all the right things and you could still die young anyways. So there's a happy thought for you. Um, but in terms of rest, in terms of Sabbath, there's an aspect where it's not even an aspect. It's just a thing of like you were created for this rhythm and if you don't exercise it in some way, shape, or form, 
then you're killing yourself. You're not loving yourself well. And if you don't love yourself well that way, then how do you stay up and pray for other people like the Son of God? How do you communicate with the Lord? How do you have the energy? And the thing that I was struggling with was I would do what to me didn't even feel like a full, days of work, full day of work, but took a full day to do because I was so tired. And then when my kids would want to hang out and do something, I didn't have the energy to do anything other than just lay around and I guess let's watch a TV show together or something like that. And so there's an aspect where I feel like, well, I'm missing out on parenting and connecting with my kids because I'm not sleeping enough or I'm not resting enough. And, and I think this is where we get into a hang-up with uh, being told what to do. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what God is convicting me of doing and how that's playing out in my life. And I think that there's an underlying principle that applies to all of us. Would any of you disagree that, that God wants you to rest on a regular basis so that you have the energy to do stuff? Is there anyone here who disagrees? If you disagree, please leave now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, if you disagree, I invite conversation. Just in case that's unclear, uh, I would love to discuss this with you. But it, it seems like a simple enough thing. Or take it to water. If you don't drink enough water, what happens? You die. Yes. You, I mean, you can get heat stroke. You can get faint. There's like initial consequences. But ultimately, if you don't drink enough water, you die. It was like one of the main things we tell middle schoolers. If there's a middle schooler who has a headache or is throwing up or something after game day on the first day, because we told you to drink water and you did not, okay? You haven't been able to drink a 12-pack of grape soda yet, and that's why you're throwing up uh, in your room with your roommates and stuff. That's a real story, by the way. Uh, I don't clean up vomit unless it's actual sickness, all right? If it's because you ate something weird, or too much of sugar, that's your thing. That's my policy, by the way, in case you ever entrust me with your teenagers. Um, but if you don't drink water, you die. And, and I don't think it's a mistake that Jesus calls himself what? The living water. If you drink from his well, and, and, and this is another thing that I used to think. Well, I drank from his well, so I don't have to thirst anymore, right? And it's like, no, you will always thirst, there was a tree of life in the garden so that to keep living, my understanding of the creation account, is that God and his presence and the tree of life and the proximity that it was to humanity was that you had the invitation to everlasting life because you would stay and continue to eat of the fruit of the Lord. But we were like, no, we're good. We've got this tree over here. Let's take off. I don't need water. Okay, pretty sure you do. So, so here's the deal. We know we need water. We know we need sleep. What does that look like in your life? For me, I started realizing, you know what? If I really want to live longer so that I can be around for my wife, that I can be around for my kids, I'd love to see grandkids. That'd be fun because we are not having any more children. And I still want to hold a baby that has some semblance of, like, I have ownership over to a certain extent. Um, I just want to give them back during the diapers and the screaming and those type of things. Uh, if I want to enjoy any of that or have the possibility to or a better possibility for that, then I need to go to sleep at a decent time to where I can get about eight hours consistently of sleep. Consistently. Like, there's a rhythm, I think at least that I've been convicted of. And if I want to have all of my organs function in the proper way that they should, and my joints to not feel horrible all the time, then probably hydration's a good thing. And it's painful because eight hours of sleep's a lot. There are multiple hours of things that I want to do that really just aren't worth it, but I still want to do them. And it's got to come out of somewhere. And you know what? There are lots of liquids out there that taste a lot better than water. 
And do you know how much water you have to drink to be properly hydrated? I'm speaking as a guy in general because there is a difference because our bodies function differently. But four liters, it's almost a gallon, sorry, if you don't metric, uh, almost a gallon of water a day. That's a lot. That's a lot of constantly going. Like sometimes I have, uh, in order to, when I'm like, oh, I'm not drinking enough water, then it's like, hey, Siri, set a 10-minute timer. Sweet. I need to grab some water, apparently. <laughs> and in 10 minutes, that'll go off. Actually, it won't because we'll be up probably leading worship, and I should probably turn it off so it doesn't go off during that. But in 10 minutes, that would go off, and I'd be like, oh, drink water. And I would gulp some water, and I would hit repeat. And I have days where I do that. How much do I do? Set a 10-minute timer to remind me to focus on Jesus. There's already a 10-minute timer. Would you like to replace it? Confirm. Oh, I referenced God. That's what's gone wrong. Um, I don't think that there is any mistake whatsoever that we were created with these physical needs to remind us of our wholeness in God spiritually as well, of my need for water, my constant need for water, should remind me to go to Jesus as the living water. My constant need for sleep, or I should say, my constant state of being exhausted (laughs) should remind me that I need to rest, and that I need to rest in the Lord, and that it's not all about my work. I love you with every fiber of my being. (laughs) I'm going to restart the timer here. There are so many analogies or metaphors of running a race, walking and not growing weary, running and not getting tired, soaring on weight. Like there's a physical aspect to our walk. And, And again, we could just go from the straight concept of uh, you need to get some cardio or some sort of exercising, whatever it is. And, and here's the cool thing. Uh, for those of you who hate running, unless it's away from someone or towards an ice cream truck, um, my preference is towards a Frisbee. Uh, I like running towards those. Uh, they're fun. Um, And I've distracted myself away from the point. You only need to walk to raise your cardio. Like, you can walk at slow or faster than just strolling and slower than running or jogging, and that's good for you. And just getting, and I'm wondering if there's even a connection to it's really hard. I mean, if you have a treadmill, you can walk inside easy. It's really boring to walk around your dining room and then you upset uh, your family members by ruining the carpet by constantly walking in a circle and and trashing that. Um, So there's almost maybe an aspect of getting outside and getting in creation as well that is encouraged by by getting out and walking. But doing something that keeps your body functioning the way that it's supposed to so that you have the endurance to do the things that you just want to do or... Uh, none of us like this word, right? Should I say it? Oh, I just did. That we should do. And, and I'm not saying that in a guilty way. I think it's more of just the, what do you, your purpose or whatever you feel like you know, like it's part of you to do, to have the energy for it, you might have to put in energy to, to keep up that energy. It sounds like a vicious circle. I hate working out. Although I've done it long enough now that I'm starting to enjoy it. And I don't know if I hate myself for that. <laughs> Running is nice. Lifting weights. I'm like, I can actually pick things up now. <laughs> that I was starting to feel sad about myself because uh, I didn't have the strength to do the things that I'd normally done before. And for the last one, I'm sorry, guys. I have to do it. Just a couple more minutes. Food. I love food. 
What does the best food have in it? And by best, I mean best tasting. Sugar? What's that? Fat. And? What's that? Hamburgers are awesome. And hamburgers have fat and what? Salt. Yes. That just means you drink more water, right? <laughs> no, nope, it doesn't. Um, in all of my fun heart studies, salt actually, too much salt ruins your body's ability for your blood vessels to uh, relax and contract properly. Like they're not as pliable. Uh, so that messes you up. And it's really amazing how low they put that salt limit. 2,000 milligrams. Mm. That's not cool. Because salt is tasty. And we're supposed, there's so many references to salt in the Bible, right? That must mean we should eat a lot of salt. Or maybe that those references don't involve eating. Maybe they involve something else, like preservation and some other things. Fertilizer. Anyways, if you want to talk more about salt, we can talk about that. I'm not going to go too much into it. But there is something to what you put into your body to fuel it. And I'm sorry, I put that on you. For me, there's something to what I have been and what I, some of the things I still continue to put into my body. I love chicken wings, man. Chicken wings are awesome. I used to say I didn't like sugar. I think I was just kidding myself. I think I had like four of those cookies yesterday at our block party with our neighbors. And they tasted okay, but I was just big enough to eat them. Because I stopped thinking about loving God, and I stopped thinking about loving others, and I stopped thinking about loving myself, and I was only thinking about what tasted good. And it's a struggle. So I invite you, if you would like to, struggle with me in one, any, or all of these areas of just asking God, how do I love you more? or better? How do I love other people more or better? How do I love myself more or better? Because those three things, like those are the greatest commandment. Like all the law and prophets can be summed up by loving God, loving others, and loving yourself. And if I'm unconsciously or consciously choosing to stick things into my body that are going to kill me, slowly or quickly, if I'm going to constantly choose to operate out of exhaustion, which limits my ability to do things. Like, seriously, I actually have gotten to the point where I love working out. Um, but the days that I don't get enough sleep, it is painful. It is so much harder. It's so much harder to focus and get anything done. But if I sleep and I'm well-rested then I have energy and desire for those things. And I operate out of that rather than trying to push through my exhaustion just to get some little thing done. Um, if I focus on constantly sticking water in my mouth of taking in Jesus, of going to him and recognizing him for who he is, and wanting to be more like him and getting to know him and, and trying to be more in love with him just by being there and recognizing that he's there, then it seems like everything just operates better. But when I'm dehydrated physically and spiritually, it's really hard to move or even care about much. So I want to invite you guys. Uh, I don't know if any of that resonates with you. Um, if all of that resonates with you. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm not trying to give you a list of things uh, that you have to do. But there is an aspect of we need to do something. We need to move forward in some way. of, And maybe it's not forward. Maybe it's sideways. Maybe it's oblique. Maybe it's backwards and kind of recognizing where we were at or where we really still are or something. And, and I think the simple step of faith is just to move towards Jesus. 
Um, and I, I think that's really all he calls us to, because again, I, I agree, like we can't produce more faith in ourselves. So it's not about like just making yourself better and conjuring up more faith. But there are little things that we can do physically and spiritually to move towards Christ, to move into relationship, to move uh, as we engage with people, like we go through the Spirit, we're with the Lord, uh, we're moving in these things. And so uh, I invite you, however that hits you, however, whatever area you may need to spend some time with the Lord in, uh, I invite you to do that with me. Um, and I've got all four areas that I'm working on, so let's talk. <laughs> if you ever want to discuss and we can encourage each other uh, with our discouragement, we can encourage each other with how the Lord has been moving. Um, but I invite you into that. And, and again, this is the first step here, the table. Uh, the Lord, his body, his blood that is here present at communion. Uh, and, and that's really it right there, communion with the Lord. All of those things should bring us communion and, and we are not bodies that are compartmentalized. Your spiritual side gets put away. Or my favorite is you die and then we're just free-floating spirits. Like that's not who we are. It's all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And I even think there's misnomers in there because my understanding of soul is that the soul is all of those things together. It's all, at least the Hebrew word. It, I'm not going to go into that, sorry. But... Uh, we have the psyche. That's you as a person. That's all of who you are. We are complete beings. And so let's not separate the spiritual and the physical. Let's move towards the Lord and all of those things. Lord, help us to realize who you are. Help us to think about you, to, to interact with you, talk to you, to look to you, Lord. As much as we need water and have to Stick water in our mouths, Lord, I pray that we would see that as us taking in life, taking in you, that we would do it that regularly, that we would realize that our thirst is more than just a physical need, Lord, but that it's, it's something deep inside of us that is thirsting for, for something that only you can fill. And so, Lord, I pray that we would have no other gods before you, that we'd have no other things that we'd want to stick into our mouths, <laughs> uh, pretending that they're you or thinking that they're better than you or thinking that they provide more life than you do. Lord, help us to, to break those habits, to break those thought processes, whatever they are, Lord. Help us to uh, just be better, to be good at ingesting you taking care of ourselves and loving ourselves well so that we can love others well and loving you well so that we can love others well and love ourselves well and just all the intertwined uh, beauty and what at times can feel messy or chaotic, Lord, but, but all those different areas coming together, Lord, to be uh, wholly loving, Lord, the way that you are, the way that you love all of yourself, all three persons of who you are, that you love all of your creation, that you care for us. Help us to be people that, that love that way and live that way. Uh, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so I think the only thing left is, uh, well, one, to remind you that uh, we don't have gathering on the patio today. Is that correct? Uh, and two, uh, hey, believe it. Believe the gospel. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, and, you know, whatever you need to do to help believe that. And I think that's what we exist for each other for, right? So help each other believe, help yourself believe, and ask God to help you believe. In Jesus' name.